Hello and welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Robotics Arena. In this video, we'll be talking about trajectory planning for robot manipulators. With Robotic System Toolbox, you can import or create 3D rigid body models of your robot manipulators, perform kinematic and dynamic analysis, and generate and execute motion trajectories, as you see here. Now, we already have a couple of videos on the kinematics and dynamics portion, so do check those out in the description below. For this video, we'll specifically focus on the trajectory planning portion. So how does this fit in, in the overall motion planning problem that is common for most robots, including manipulators? Typically, your robot is given some kind of task, and that task will sometimes involve having to go from a current position to some goal position. And that's where path planning comes in, where you can generate a set of points that will take you from that start to that goal pose. With that path, you can then generate a trajectory to schedule or follow that path. And then once you have that reference, you of course need the low-level control capabilities for your robot to actually be able to follow the path. So the biggest question is, what's the difference then between a path and a trajectory? So typically a path denotes space only. It's a set of points that will link between a start and a goal pose, for example. Whereas a trajectory involves the scheduling of the motion to follow. So it includes time information as well as the space. And it's not only what position you'll be at, but also perhaps what speed and what acceleration your, your manipulator might take. Here we'll focus on the trajectory planning portion, and we'll show this in MATLAB and Simulink with a model of the 7 Degree of Freedom Canova Gen 3 robot manipulator. There's many types of motion trajectories, and one such classification is this notion of joint space versus task space. Remember that the fundamental problem in motion with manipulators is that you need some way to map between the motion of some target coordinate that you're interested in, like the end effector position, and the individual joint angles or the configuration of the robot. So in a task-based trajectory, what you do is you take those waypoints and you interpolate them in the task or the operating space to generate a trajectory. Once you're executing that trajectory, you will then solve the inverse kinematics at each time step so that you can get a set of commands for joint positions as you're periodically evaluating the trajectory. Let's contrast this with the joint space trajectory in which you have these reference waypoints and then you solve the inverse kinematics only at those individual waypoints. So that essentially gives you a set of joint angle waypoints that can then be fit into a trajectory. And the key difference is that with the task-based trajectory, you are doing less work on the trajectory generation portion at the beginning, but more on the trajectory following. And the opposite goes for the joint space trajectory. And this fundamental difference gives rise to several advantages and disadvantages. Because in the task space trajectory, you have to execute inverse kinematics at every time step, that's going to be more computationally demanding. And that's especially true as your manipulator becomes more complex and if you're using an optimization-based solver instead of an analytical one. The other thing about the joint space trajectory is that the actuator motion is smoother because you're actually interpolating in those joint angles. And that makes it easier to validate too, because you're directly controlling bounds, for example, on the position, velocity, or acceleration of the joint angles themselves. You can really ensure actuator limits, for example. Now, on the other hand, task space trajectories do have their clear advantages. The main one is that the motion in the task space is predictable. So say, for example, that you're prescribing a straight line motion between two points for your end effector to follow. With a task space trajectory, assuming that your joint angles are feasibly able to follow that straight line, that trajectory will be a straight line in space. Whereas in the joint space trajectory, those intermediate points may be some kind of curve that will not follow a shortest path. And what that also means is in the task based trajectories, the motion is this predictable. You have a, a better way of handling and validating things like collisions with obstacles or enforcing joint limits. Whereas in the joint space trajectory, you might actually violate these things as you're you know, interpolating between two reference sets of uh, joint angles. OK, so let's compare a joint space and a task space trajectory in MATLAB. Let me run this section first just to show you the reference path. As you see here, there are four waypoints in space that we're going to be following, and we'll see the difference between these two types of trajectories that we introduced. I will run this whole script then, and then we'll be looking at the timing in the command window. So you see that the task-based trajectory generation is still executing. Remember that this is the one that's solving the inverse kinematics at every step that you're running, and it's taken about 28 seconds, and the joint space trajectory already finished at about 0.9 seconds. So you can see that time difference, and that's because we've chosen quite a few uh, points to sample on. If I look at the two different trajectories that were followed, here you see that first difference, right? That the task-based trajectory in blue is actually the straight lines that we prescribed to interpolate between those points. Whereas the joint space trajectory in red follows these curved shapes and isn't quite doing a straight line. However, we'll see how this maps to the actuator motion now. You see, for the first joint, the trajectories are very different. 
which could be fine. They both follow the path in some way. And one thing you'll see is the joint space trajectory in red here is generally smoother than the blue one, which is the task space. And, and you can you can mostly see this in the slope of these curves. For example, on the left side around one second, the slope for that task space trajectory is pretty high, and that does not happen in the joint space. And you can kind of see the same with some of the other joints in that the blue trajectories tend to have a higher slope and more actuator motion in general. Um, with some joints, for example, here in joint number four, the task and joint space trajectories are somewhat equivalent. And this typically has to do when the joint is not providing some redundant degree of freedom that other joints can also contribute to. Now, regardless of whether you choose joint space or task-based trajectories, there are many ways of designing these interpolating trajectories. The first one that we'll look at is known as trapezoidal trajectories. And these are called trapezoidal trajectories because of their velocity profile, that it linearly ramps up to a constant velocity and then linearly ramps back down to typically zero. And as an effect of that velocity profile, the acceleration is then just piecewise constant, and the position becomes quadratic at those acceleration phases and linear in between when you have constant velocity. And this gives rise to other alternative names for these trajectories, such as linear segments with parabolic blends, or LSPB, and S-curves. Now, trapezoidal trajectories have a couple advantages. One is that they're relatively simple to implement, which also means they're simple to validate. You see that, for example, the, the trapezoidal or the piecewise constant velocity and acceleration profiles can be very easily matched against, for example, maximum limits that you want to enforce. And also, because of how these trajectories are set up, the position will never actually overshoot its target because you're always accelerating and decelerating from your initial point or to your final point. And this is why they're commonly used in safety critical applications such as industrial robotics. So now we'll see an example of a trapezoidal velocity trajectory running for this Kinova Gen 3 robot arm. If I zoom in here, you will see that these waypoints are being followed by the end effector. And if you look closely, right around the waypoints, that end effector is going to speed up as it leaves the waypoint and then slow down as it arrives at the next waypoint. And that's because of the nature of these trapezoidal trajectories. In fact, if I look for the code that did this, you see here I'm using the trapvelTraj function to generate that trajectory. And if I plot the resulting trajectory using this line of code in the x, y, and z locations, Again, you will see, for example, that this trajectory for the Z position does follow that trapezoidal velocity profile with the um, constant accelerations. Th those slopes are just because of the sample rate. Um, and the, the position trajectory is this uh, linear segment with parabolic blends. And you would see the same thing for, for instance, the Y trajectory and the X trajectory. Another common type of trajectory are polynomial trajectories. And these take two common flavors. One is the cubic or third order trajectory. And the other one is the quintic or fifth order trajectory. These are both essentially the same in that you specify certain properties like position, velocity, and if quintic acceleration and the endpoints of each trajectory segment. And then a set of coefficients for a polynomial are fit so that you get this trajectory profile like you see here. Uh, polynomial trajectories have a nice advantage in that because you're able to set the velocities and accelerations at the endpoints, you can, for example, perform a trajectory that doesn't stop at each intermediate waypoint by setting some non-zero intermediate velocities. Depending on how you set up the endpoint conditions of polynomial trajectories, they might be a little bit more difficult to validate. So that's a design trade-off that you can make. Now, let's look at the same example with polynomial trajectories. So I'm, I will switch over to a quintic trajectory type here. And that will basically just change my code so that instead of using trap bell traj, I'm now using quintic polytraj below. But similarly, if I were to execute this code, you'll now see this quintic trajectory looks as follows. And the reason that this trajectory doesn't have straight lines is because we've set non-zero endpoint velocities for the waypoint. So that it has this you know, rounded out shape as where we have these intermediate uh, velocities of the waypoints. And again, if you look closely, then the manipulator doesn't slow down like it did with the trapezoidal trajectory. Uh, what's interesting is that I can change these endpoint velocities for instance, if I say uh, waypoint velocities, and I'm just going to multiply them by two, let's say, right? and if I run this again, you'll now see that the shape of the trajectory is significantly different because of those endpoint velocities. Of course, if I were to just cancel out of this and then set my waypoint velocities to zeros, 
and I were to rerun that same loop, then you should see that the trajectory now does revert back to just being straight lines, because that's now what the polynomial is fitting to. If I were now to go back to the initial uh, trajectory with the default velocities, I can also display the, the trajectory here. So let me evaluate that code and show you the figures. And again, Compare this to the trapezoidal trajectory, where now the velocity is not trapezoidal, but rather is the basically the differential of the quintic polynomial. And same thing for the acceleration profile. That's also going to be the, basically the second derivative of, of that original trajectory. One other thing that we did not talk about was this notion of orientation. That so far, we only showed trajectory generation and following with position only. Now, you probably want to also change the orientation of the end effector for a manipulator, especially if you're doing things like pick and place operations. In general, interpolating between angles is a little bit more tricky than doing so with positions, and that's because angles are continuously wrapping, for example, in the range between minus pi and plus pi. And other representations for rotation, like Euler angles, can also pose their challenges. For example, there might be multiple sets of orientation that can lead to the same result, uh, and this ambiguity has a lot of names, including things like gimbal lock. So the solution is to interpolate between quaternions, quaternions being a way to unambiguously represent orientation. And the way that this is implemented in MATLAB is through the spherical linear interpolation or slurp method, which interpolates quaternions along a sphere. And that leads to the shortest path between two orientations at a uniform angular velocity about a fixed axis. So going back to MATLAB now, I'll open another script that follows the same waypoints that we had before, but now also incorporates the reference orientations. So we'll define the points as we did before and once again, define the type of trajectory. So let's assume we're using trapezoidal. Now there's a little bit of a difference because we're, we're doing two things. One is we're using, for example, the trap Veltrage function to generate the trapezoidal trajectory in position. And then as I keep scrolling down, additionally, I'm going to be using the rot trage or rotation trajectory function to generate the trajectory for the orientations in that segment. And combining those two and then solving the inverse kinematics should give me a trajectory that also honors orientation. So let's see how this looks. And you see for this one, we're actually plotting the, the entire uh, coordinate triad for the coordinate frames. So now you see that the, the end effector is basically pitching down and it also yawed a little bit. Um, maybe that was, you couldn't see that, but let's change the camera view a little bit. And again, here you'll see that yaw rotation on the end effector as well. And, and these are all reference orientations that you can change as well with the rotation trajectory. Now, we said that slurp does uh, linear interpolation and orientation, but what if we want to have that trapezoidal or that polynomial behavior on the orientation as well? Luckily, there is this notion of time scaling that you can provide to both the rotation and the transform trajectories in MATLAB. And I'll just show you this really quickly, that using, for example, the transform traj or rot traj function, you can specify what is known as a time scaling, and it links to these variables. And these variables are basically a way to scale some kind of normalized time, like zero to one, using a trajectory like trapezoidal or, or cubic or quintic that you see defined up here. So there is a possibility to also have time scale trajectories. Now, so far, we've only shown MATLAB examples, but all of these functionality is also available in Simulink. So for example, here's a model that combines the rotation trajectory with either a polynomial or a trapezoidal trajectory. Here are the two blocks that I can switch between for trapezoidal or polynomial trajectory. Inside of this subsystem, I'm extracting each individual trajectory segment and putting it through the rotation trajectory block. And then we have our other necessary utilities like the coordinate transform conversions and the inverse kinematic solution. So passing in these waypoints, you know, I can run the simulation. And now I have this graphical environment that I can use to similarly verify my trajectory generation and execution. So again, this is the same trajectory as before, but run in Simulink. Now, what's good about Simulink is it lets you do a little bit more introspection. So for example, if I were to zoom into the, say, the outputs of the inverse kinematics, these joint angles, I can click on the signal and take a look at those values for my joint angles and radians. Or, or furthermore, if I want to do even further analysis and visualization, I could hook this up to a scope block, or I could stop the simulation go to my simulation data inspector here, right? So you'll see the log data here for the joint angles. This is all I'm logging in the model, but you could add more. And then I could go into each of these joint angles and verify what has come out. And then, you know, you could, for example, add data cursors to start comparing the values and so on. What this then lets you do is integrate with 
other pieces of software that you can also use MATLAB and Simulink to develop. So now I'll show one last example that takes the same trajectory generation and following utilities that we created. So we have our transform trajectory here, which combines position and orientation. We're putting it through a time scaling, which we can switch between trapezoidal and polynomial. I'm using trapezoidal right now. And instead of using constant blocks, now we're going to be using the robot operating system or ROS to receive the waypoint times and the waypoint poses themselves so that we can change these on the fly. So I'm going to start ROS, publish some initial waypoints, and then kick off the simulation. So what I'll show you now in MATLAB is that I've created an app for using App Designer that lets me modify and publish waypoints uh, using these ROS messages. So you know, once I have all of this set up, uh, you see that these are the same waypoints as before. What I can do is go into this app and I can add other intermediate waypoints. So let's say, for instance, I want to put something at 14 seconds at a particular pose, and let's also give it a, a certain pitch, maybe uh, negative pi over two radians. Once I've updated this table, I can select publish, and then that's going to now change my set of waypoints and regenerate a traje trajectory. And then now you'll see that the following problem is a little bit different. Um, and our, our robot is now going to this last waypoint that we introduced up here. And then I can always, you know, also remove waypoints, republish, and then see how that changes the problem. And right now we have a MATLAB app talking to Simulink. But for example, if you were to take the Simulink model and deploy it onto your real robot or to a simulator, then MATLAB now just becomes a design environment where you can still use this app, but communicate with something that's actually out there in the real world. So just one idea, and uh, if you want to know more about these files, you can certainly download them from the link in the description. So we just saw lots of examples on MATLAB and Simulink for trajectory generation and following. So a couple of key takeaways. First of all, we outline the difference between a trajectory and a path, in that a path is a set of points in space that you want to follow, and trajectory is more of a schedule, including time, speed, acceleration, on how to follow that path as a function of time. Trajectories can be generated either in joint space or task space, and we discuss the advantages and disadvantages of both. Regardless of which one you choose, there are many ways that we presented for interpolating. We saw, for example, polynomial and trapezoidal velocity interpolating trajectories, as well as the slurp method for interpolating between orientations. And there's other approaches as well, so check out the documentation for Robotic System Toolbox to learn more. Now, with all these examples, hopefully you've seen that you can explore different design options using MATLAB and Simulink and do things like verifying the trajectory, seeing if there's any improvements to be made. And optionally, then you can generate standalone C or C++ code to target other software frameworks or hardware. And perhaps the most important key takeaway is that trajectories are also used in other types of robots. So everything we showed you here is not specific to manipulators. Trajectories are used in, for example, mobile robots, self-driving cars, or unmanned aerial vehicles, to name a few. As always, thank you for watching this video. If you need to get in touch with us, feel free to email us or reach us on Facebook, and check out some of these other links below. Thank you for watching.